Hello and welcome everyone today with us on St. Jamestown TV. Today we have a very exceptional guest, very powerful and went through many challenges. Today we have Georgia Snederman. Hi, how are you doing Georgia? Good, very well. Thank you for having me. <laughs> Thank you very much for coming. Um, how are you doing with the COVID and lockdown everything? <laughs> yeah, you know, I actually uh, aside from the social isolation, uh, you know, I'm a hugger. So I really miss that, you know, the, the, the see people and you can't, uh, you can't hug them or whatever. Um, but you know, our family has done okay, really in the circumstances and we just want to get back to normal, so to speak, like everybody else. Minister of Provincial Parliament representing the St. James Town and Region Park riding of Toronto Centre from 1999 to 2009. First openly gay MPP elected in Ontario and first openly gay cabinet minister. Minister of Health and Long-Term Care from 2003 to 2007. Minister of Energy and Infrastructure from 2008 to 2009 and Deputy Premier of Ontario from 2006 to 2009. Georgia resigned as an MPP in 2010 to contest the mayorality of Toronto, narrowly losing to Doug Ford. He was born in 1964 in Western Ontario and spent much of his early years in Etobicoke. I had a, I had a pretty good upbringing uh, in central Etobicoke. But you know, when I ran for mayor, I didn't get very many votes in Etobicoke. So I'm a little bit bitter at Etobicoke, okay? Just so you know, I talk about it a lot. I got my start as a kid in politics there. But when it came to getting votes there, I didn't do too good. So, uh, you know, that's one thing. Um, my parents were uh, not well-educated people, but were hardworking and uh, uh, worked together to build a family business in trucking. So uh, when I was born in 1964 as the fourth kid, our family bought a house in central Etobicoke with a swimming pool and uh, we enjoyed that kind of middle class life existence. My father was not around much, always working, and my mother played the leading role in the management of the family home and, and stuff. But when I was 10 or 11, my parents got divorced. And that really was a huge, upsetting but in some ways positive experience also because my parents both ended up with partners that were better suited to them in my opinion so I got a bigger family and an enriched life over time but it was disruptive of course to a 10 or 11 year old and I think this is where politics came in because I got involved in politics as a 15 year old and the Liberal Party which then was dominated by women running the operation at the local campaign and really they invited me in and made me part of their family. So um, yeah, my life in Etobicoke included uh, going to a school called Burnham Thorpe Collegiate, made very, uh, very, very important recently because Catherine O'Hara from Schitt's Creek also went to Burnham Thorpe Collegiate. So her Wikipedia references me as another prominent student of Burnham Thorpe Collegiate. This is the most important thing that's ever happened in my life, okay? Some, uh, some uh, uh, association with uh, some, uh, uh, some uh, star of a funny comedy. But Burnham Thorpe Collegiate, I became the student council president in that place. And uh, really it satisfied so many of my uh, uh, cravings for uh, politics and being involved. Your passion was for politics from the beginning. How did you run into it? Like what was the first sparkle? <laughs> I think full credit to my grandmother. So, you know, I didn't come from a family that was active in politics, but my grandmother was an admirer of Pierre Trudeau's. And then around 1979, when Joe Clark became the Prime Minister of Canada for a while, Trudeau lost, he quit, then he came back, and then in 1980, there was an election that occurred, and I got very involved. I turned 16 during that election. I went to the campaign office every day after school, and really, this is where I mentioned before, is the Liberal Party became like a family to me. And so it was, an, it was 
my values, it was a place to exercise my values that had been influenced by my mother and my grandmother, but also to find, uh, you know, a social and collegial uh, connection. And I mentioned before the role of prominent women uh, in the campaign who really uh, nurtured me. So it was, you know, I was, I was addicted. You know, I was like, I was very, very, very into politics from 15 years of age. And it was a distraction to me to the point that, you know, certainly in a way it should have motivated me to go to university, but I was so smitten with it that it distracted me to work at it immediately. So I spent a good bit of my life working in politics from quite a young age. When my contemporaries were still in university, I was holding responsible jobs working for other politicians. So even though I haven't always worked in politics, at different stages of my life for a long time, I've had a chance to work at my passion. Like politics became my hobby and my passion and my joy and I got the privilege of working in that field in many different ways and I feel so fortunate really as I look back on my life it's been you know exceptional not all perfect and such but I've had amazing opportunities and seen so many things and done so many things and met so many people that I feel so fortunate really so lucky. Wow, wow, that's very powerful. And then I came downtown, and then life really started. Wow, could you, could you tell me about that? Yeah, yeah sure, well, downtown, well, um, downtown I, I moved downtown, uh, got my own place in 1987. Uh, you know, that's a long time ago now. That was uh, right by Maple Leaf Gardens on Wood Street. And, uh, uh, you know, this was important to me because it was also the beginning of me expressing myself more openly as a gay person. So I came downtown and I was working in the government of, at Queen's Park and living, you know, living an exceptional, uh, living exceptional life. And over the course of many years, I lived in all different parts of downtown Toronto Center or uh, or what have you in Cabbage Town uh, on Rose Avenue just by Wellesley Street so close to St. James Town um, and uh, you know it's really been the exceptional opportunity to come to know the downtown neighborhoods and to have known so many people in those places and uh, during that time I uh, also came to be to come came to know Barbara Hall our great former mayor, who was like my big sister. We ran the campaign to try and save the Wellesley Hospital, worked with Pam McConnell and Barbara on the community center, and so many pieces of history that now I look around, the Re Regent Park redevelopment, the new neighborhood in the West Donlands, uh, uh, et cetera. And I've been so lucky, really, to have a chance to play a role in helping to build neighborhoods and build communities over a long period of time. And yeah, I've just uh, been so fortunate, so lucky. Unconventional Candor, a book written by George Smitherman in collaboration with former Trauma Star editor Ian Urquhart. The book was published in 2019, talking about success, struggles, tragedy, in addition to Smitherman's journey with mental health and addiction. What inspired you to write your book? Um, I just, what inspired me to write my book was the chance that was actually, um, I, well, I was, in, I, was, I was excited to have a chance to tell my story and to put it out there um, because it's a unique story. And if it influences one or two people in a good way, then that's awesome. For me, I've always found from the time that I came out as a gay man, that's liberating. And even getting things off your chest that are holding you back or what have you is like, just having the chance to express those things is uh, liberating in its own right too. So that's why I called the book Unconventional Candor. Um, you know, because uh, I laid a, you know, I laid quite a few things on the line there quite openly because I think that's the way, well, I just think that's often, you know, that's to be transparent 
is to create more prospect for that openness contributes to um, giving other people hope and people are so our society is a very forget you know is really a very forgiving a very forgiving society and such and um, I you know I wanted people to know that especially people coping with addiction like if we think about one aspect of the book that I address I didn't write it in I think oh this could be in every chapter instead I'm just gonna make it two or three pages a little bit intense for some people I couldn't write the book till my mother had passed like some of those things were you know a little bit hard to put out there and stuff but uh, it was it was it was a great privilege to have a chance to write that uh, to write that book how did you manage all the difficulties you have been through <sighs> I don't know I mean um, you know, I've had a few traumas. So, you know, people talk about, I talk about political post-traumatic stress disorder. That's when you lose an election to Rob Ford and you had to do a hundred all candidates meetings with them. And people have no idea how lonely that was and how uh, ruthless those Ford people were and, uh, and all of that. But, you know, obviously the loss of my partner to suicide was, uh, you know, um, you know, an unfathomably difficult experience. One of the most difficult struggles to anyone in which George had been through, coping with the loss of his husband. Smitherman married his partner Christopher Peloso on August 5, 2007, near Elliott Lake in Ontario. Two years later, they decided to raise a family. In 2009, the Toronto Star reported that Smetherman and Palazzo had been approved as adoptive parents by the Toronto Children's Aid Society. They adopted two children, named Michael and Kayla. Not too long after, Pelosa's suffering with clinical depression led him to take his own life in 2013. I say that, you know, the, the, the real, the simple answer is how did I survive that? I had no choice but to survive it because I had two small children, three and five, and they got up the next morning and I explained to them that their data wasn't coming home and they still needed to be fed and supported and nurtured. And if I couldn't get out of bed, that wasn't going to work out. And if they hadn't have been there, who knows? honestly but they were and we mar you know we soldiered on and uh, we had the love and support of people and community barbara hall you know i i mentioned like mo you know barbara and her husband max most notably even till today i'll go and see them when i leave here you know they've um uh you know they just are an example of the people that pitched in and uh and uh, supported us so you know we really live by the adage what doesn't kill you makes you stronger and um, you know live to live for another day and hardly a day goes by that we don't celebrate Christopher mention Christopher talk about him he's a he's a reality in our life and um, uh, you know we 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 know that uh, we know that uh, depression uh, had him in its in its grips, and um, th this is also why it's important to talk openly about mental health and addiction. Um, and you know, I'm very proud also because even as a minister of health, before talking openly about suicide, I put it out there about my own history with addiction, and that was a political. I didn't really intend to do it. And then I had to, you know, explain to my boss, Dalton McGinty, who's the most compassionate person and a, and a good person. So uh, I look back even now to the way that our society has emerged to be more open about mental health. And I contributed to that as a government minister with my own openness and my book contributes to it. And um, I, just, I just came to learn that I came to learn from the experience of coming out that being open is liberating, like I mentioned to you before. And so um, not pretending, you know, the, not pretending about things and confronting them 
forthrightly. I think those are really big secrets to being able to cope with impactful and traumatic events. That's why I really believe in terms of mental, um, we look at our uh, healthcare system and the many inadequacies that it has, especially for mental health. Because, I, and I personally feel that we need more and more mechanisms for people to talk to a psychiatrist, to a social worker, to a nurse practitioner, to, a, to just actually the process of opening up and putting it on the record, to me and in, to my mind, is one of the most essential aspects of recovery. So I just encourage, you know, I just, I just encourage it. That's so true, that's so true. And how did the kids uh, deal with the trauma and how did they understand? And I'm, I'm, I'm guessing they are now uh, going through like uh, a teenage, right? Like they're- 10 and 12, yeah. not quite, uh, <laughs> I got the preteens. I think that the kids have taken their lead from me insofar as we don't play to the stigma of suicide. We don't pretend that that isn't part of our reality. Kayla in particular uh, is very curious and uh, Google searches. You know, so there was a point in time that I told the kids on the morning, at, uh, dad is not coming home again, he's passed away. Well, I had to update that story as they matured to make them understand that he had passed by his own hand. And um, as they get older, you know, they may become more curious about details or what have you. Well, we just speak openly about these things within the within appro you know within appropriateness. I would never, I would never burden them with information which is my which is better better not shared as a burden. But overall, um, you know, seeking to make sure that we're not playing to any uh, to any uh, to any stigma um, and you know we're uh, we're a very strong unit and then you know in 2017 I met a man uh, Rolando who's with us who's a very strong presence uh, in his own right so now we're an even stronger uh, now we're an even stronger unit and now we have a Spanish connection to Cuba oh, you know that's so awesome. that's yeah. beautiful thank yeah. you like maybe the Latin music would make uh, you overcome the lockdown. Well, I don't dance. Everybody knows that. But uh, but uh, uh, actually, yesterday in our kitchen, Rolando and Kayla were practicing the salsa. So uh, uh, you know, this was this was very uh, this was very encouraging. And if we ever get to travel again, we have a really nice house in Havana. So yeah, that's, that's a beautiful. Started the Spanish lessons already or not? <laughs> No, <laughs> no hablamos español. <laughs> My single biggest stated regret in life is that I never mastered French because I had Pierre Trudeau as an inspiration and I had the values of bilingualism, but I never really had the discipline to master it. Now I'm living with a Spanish person and it's that same complicated grammar that now I know why it was so difficult for me, you know. I have a decent accent, but I don't know what I'm saying. What, what is the, uh, the profession uh, your, uh, your partner now has? Ah, he's a, he's a, in his native Cuba, he's a dentist. So uh, he's working through that very rigorous process to try and be licensed as a dentist here. With your experience as a health minister, how, how is it going with your uh, partner now? As <laughs> oh, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's fun because uh, when he hangs out with the dentists and the dentists to be, they get a lot of information from current dentists. Um, and a lot of dentistry is in the private realm for, you know, and my values are a little more in the public realm. So I'm always like counseling him as like, make sure that your practice is gonna, you know, have a support for a proportion of people on ODSP because not all dentists will do dental work for them and stuff like that. So I'm always like pushing back at my social values uh, to influence, uh, uh, to influence uh, what he might like to do, but um, he, he's just so motivated to uh, to help people. And it's it's funny because um, soon after I met him, I had a tooth that went bad, and they wanted to do another root canal on it. I'd already had one, and you know these root canals cost like. 
three. It was a molar. They charge more for the big ones. It was like $3,000. I'm like, that tooth is gone, but I'm going to go to Cuba. I'm going to, instead of paying, I'm just going to book another ticket because he was in Cuba at the time. So I went to Cuba and I got him to extract it. So I thought it's like a real test of early love is how much do I trust this man? Well, I'm going to let him yank a tooth out of my, uh, I'm going to let him yank a tooth out of my head. So, uh, That's real, uh trust, uh, trust. yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. This saved me some money too. <laughs> Do you uh, encourage your children to uh, to uh, work in politics, or they have? I, you know, I would just encourage them to work at all. Like there's, uh, I think that. Um well, I don't think there, there's any chance that my son Michael would be interested in politics, but I think there's a lot of chance that Kayla would, and she has all of my worst habits, uh, and she likes to uh, talk, and uh, sometimes too much, and sometimes in the wrong way and all of that, but uh, I, I, I suppose I could see it. Uh, how could I not, I'm, I'm never gonna push like, I'm never going to be the parent that pushes their kid to, f that was my life, that doesn't have to be your life. But on the other hand, if you're interested, well of course then, uh, you know, I could, uh, you know, I could hel help you in any way that I possibly, uh, what possibly could. What's the, the dominant party uh, in your home? <laughs> oh no, no, there's only, uh, there's only one, uh, there's only one political party. Uh, <laughs> There will be no other political parties allowed in my home for as long as it's my home. <laughs> That's terrible. I mean, if my daughter, I think actually, you know, in the, in the election, uh, the last federal election, uh, Kayla voted for the Green, they did the class, she was at Lord Dufferin, and they did the classroom voting, and she voted for Annamy Paul. She voted for the Green Party candidate. Well, we had just met her on the street and had a nice conversation, and, you know, we're liberals, but not really Bill Morno liberals so much, so, you know, Kayla voted Green Party, and I didn't give her a hard time about it, so, uh, but, uh, you know, the Liberal Party, uh, you know, that, that runs pretty deep, uh, <laughs> that runs pretty deep. I can have policy decisions disagreements yeah. you know I think you know the Liberal Party in Ontario and nationally is too interested in nuclear power so I will always let them know about these things but you know that's my that's my home and I'm a I'm a I'm a I'm a centrist person and I've found great enjoyment from being able to if you're a centrist you can have friends across the landscape if you're way over here on the right or way over here on the left, chances are you can't really talk to too many other people. So I always, right. you know, I always, uh, I always enjoyed that aspect of uh, that aspect of uh, the Liberal Party in the political context. Yeah. If there is one thing you would like to to say at the end of, of this beautiful conversation, what would you? Oh, I just like to say thank you. Thank you to you, and of course, especially as some of the people that might uh, watch us are. Uh, uh, my future neighbors in St. Jamestown and my, my former neighbors as I've lived all around that, uh, all around there and you know just to say that like thank you for the privilege of being in public life because uh, it's just given me a chance to experience so many things and meet so many people so I'm happy to have a chance to talk about it and thank you for inviting me. Thank you, thank you. George Smetherman, that's amazing. I really enjoyed the conversation. It's me very too. open, very friendly, informative. I, I really enjoyed it. Thank you very much. Me too. Thank have a nice day. You thank you. Too. Please do not forget to like, comment, and share to our channel. Follow us on all our social media platforms. And for more information, please check out our website.